Western halibut. Would you like it whole? Or I can easily cut it up into fillets for you. Well, how about a salmon? Look at that beautiful salmon. You can tell it's fresh by just looking very hard at that eye. It's very clear, it's not dull and cloudy. Look in at the gills, they're nice and fresh and red. And look at that glistening skin, that is a beauty. Now here's another way to tell how it's fresh. Just smell it, <laughs> this one's got teeth. <laughs> so there's not a trace of fishiness there. If it's fishy at all, don't buy it. That's a fresh baby. Beautiful mackerel, those are glistening in this very handsome eastern red snappers. You know that the scales are very tightly attached and they glisten. Or how about fish in pieces? Tuna fish, you can eat that raw in sushi or broil it in steaks. Quite a bit less expensive is the fillet of bluefish. That's a lovely fish, rather like a mackerel. And of course, salmon steaks if you want to put a little money into your fish. Shark, delicious, tastes very much like swordfish, half the price. But if it's swordfish you're after, look at big, thick swordfish steaks, perfect for broiling. Now before you broil any fish, you want to make sure that it's good and dry. And these fish steaks are about half an inch thick and I'm salting them on each side. And then I'm going to oil the bottom part. I'm using oil rather than butter because I don't want it to burn. I can use some butter at the end. And now a little oil on the top. And in this, it's a good trick for broiling, is just concentrate on the top of the fish so that's nice and crusty. And then to keep the bottom moist and the rest of the flesh moist under the crust, put in a little liquid. I'm using a bit of dry white wine or vermouth, just about an eighth of an inch, and that's ready to broil. Notice I've got my broiler on here red hot, and to raise the height a little bit of the rack, I put a jelly roll pan in there. You've got to have it just as close under the broiler element as possible. I'm going to leave it there for one minute. Now I'm going to give it a little butter basting. That'll help it brown. And I'll be back in five minutes. There. All done, beautifully browned on top. I never had to turn it over. It just took five minutes and it's ready to serve in its own juices. I think the very best way to do fresh trout is saute manier, that's sauteed in butter. And these three trout have been thoroughly dried, lightly salted in pepper, and you note that the heads have been left on. That's so that you'll know they're trout. This is the classic method of doing them. And in here, this pan, I have about an eighth of an inch of clarified butter, and that's nicely heated, and I'm going to, just before sautéing them, I dredge them in flour. And they're to cook very slowly for five to six minutes on each side. Now I'm going to turn them and cook them for four or five minutes on the other side. Now well, that's been five minutes on each side, and to tell when it's done, one way is to open up the fish a little bit and look in there. If it's red to the bone or the flesh is pink, it's not quite done. And another method is to cut right along this back fin and pull it out. If that comes out easily, it's done. The fish should be juicy, not dry and flaky. Now just before serving, a little bit of lemon, some melted butter, good and hot, and a little bit of parsley overall. And there you have it, trout minier. Here, looking at you, is a gray sole. It's a great, big, beautiful one. Actually, it's not a sole. It's a flounder, but it's one of our very best flat fish. And when you filleted it out, you get two nice big fillets, one on each side. And I like to cut them in half lengthwise, and you notice it has two sides to the flesh. One is darker and a little rough. That was the skin side, and you score it lightly so it won't curl up when you cook it. 
Here I'm sauteing these fillets in clarified butter. They've been dried and salted and peppered and dredged in flour, and they only take a minute or so on each side. Notice I'm really sauteing these over high heat. I want them to seize on the bottom so I can turn them. Then they just need about a minute on the other side. Now as quickly as that, they're done. Out onto a hot platter. Now I'm gonna make a little butter sauce with capers. I'm just gonna put some fresh butter in there. Let that heat up and bubble. And here's some, a spoonful of capers. That makes a very nice sauce. Such a simple one. Solmanier with caper sauce. Easy, fast, delicious. Here's a great big beautiful fresh Pacific Red Snapper. I just thought I'd show it to you because I had it around the house. But what I'm going to do are some Red Snapper fillets sautéed in fresh breadcrumbs. It has a lovely crust on the outside and it's a nice way to do fillets. I have salted and peppered them lightly and scored the underside. And now to begin, you drop it into flour, shake off the excess, and then I've got beaten egg here. That's one egg and one teaspoon of salt, I mean in one teaspoon of oil and a little salt and pepper. And then shake off the excess there. And the reason you have the egg is so that you can make these white, fresh breadcrumbs adhere onto the fish. So there they are all nicely on. And then you want to set the crumbs so Refrigerate it for half an hour. I'm going to saute these fish fillets in clarified butter. You notice I've done them all in clarified butter, and the reason is that you can heat clarified butter much hotter, and it won't burn, and you're still going to get the wonderful taste of good butter. Now I'll get the fish fillets, which have been sitting in here, contemplating their crumbs, or at least hoping that they've held their onto their crumbs, so that when they go into the pan, the crumbs will adhere. And I've got the oil quite hot, the butter is quite hot, not too hot, because I don't, the fish fillets are going to take about two minutes on each side, and I don't want the crumbs to burn. Now that's been about two minutes. Oh, and that's nicely brown on that side. You know, this is a very nice technique for fish that's a little bit flimsy and tends to fall apart because the crumbs and eggs hold it together. I'm being very careful over there. There. Now about two minutes on this side and they're done. Well, a delicious accompaniment to fish sautéed this way is a homemade tartar sauce. Here I've got a cup and a half of homemade mayonnaise and there's a tablespoon or two of chopped squeezed capers and there's a dill pickle chopped up and I have a sieved hard-boiled, two sieved hard-boiled egg yolks. They always have hard-boiled eggs, and there's a chopped egg white and about three tablespoons of chopped green herbs like parsley, and then a little bit of lemon juice to taste. And that's all there is to it, your own homemade tartar sauce. Fillets a Pacific Red Snapper sautéed in fresh breadcrumbs in butter and your own homemade tartar sauce. You know, poaching is a lovely way to do fish, particularly salmon, but you don't have to poach a whole salmon. You don't even have to poach a whole fillet. You can poach it in pieces. You can poach it in cross-cut steaks like this. I don't really like it done in steaks. I don't mind the bones. I don't mind the skin but it sort of poaches out of shape, it don't look good. I'd much rather have a fillet like this and have it all nicely skinned and then cut into eight ounce pieces like this. They poach beautifully. Now here I've got eight nice chunks of salmon and boiling water there, and that's enough water to cover. I've got two quarts of water and there's a tablespoon of salt and a quarter cup 
of wine vinegar. And the vinegar's there that kind of holds the fish together. And I'm going to let it poach there very slowly for eight minutes exactly. Now during those eight minutes of cooking time, keep an eye on it every once in a while. You don't want it actually to boil. It should just almost simmer. Plain poaching is a marvelous way to do this king of fish. It's so pure you get the full flavor of the salmon. You can eat it just as it is with lemon, but there's nothing wrong with a little hollandaise sauce. Now when you've gone to all the trouble to get some beautiful fresh fish, it's really silly if you don't keep it very fresh. And the way to keep it fresh is to ice it down. And I have here a bag, plastic bag of ice. There's my fish, and the fish is on top of a plastic bag of ice. And just keep it iced down in the fridge until you're going to cook it. And that'll keep it as fresh as you possibly can. And now we're going to do a very fine recipe, a classical one, for fillets of fish poached in white wine in a delicious sauce. And this is for thin fillets of fish like sole or flounder. This happened to be tripe, trout, not tripe, trout. And I'm salting and peppering on one side, and now turn it over and salt it and pepper on the other side. And as you see, this other side, the skin side, has been scored so the fish won't curl around. And now I have a buttered flame-proof baking dish here, and in it I'm going to put half a tablespoon of minced shallots or scallions, either one. And in it, I lay the trout, that scored side down and pretty side up, because I'm going to bake and serve it in the same dish. It's a nice way to do trout, because there's no bones. And now I'm going to pour around just a little bit, about an eighth of an inch of dry white wine or dry white French vermouth. That's, I always use French vermouth. A little bit more shallots on top. And then cover that with a buttered piece of wax paper, and I'm going to bring it to the simmer on top of the stove. The reason for starting this fish on top of the stove is to bring the pan up to temperature. Because if I put it in the oven now, heaven knows how long it would take to heat up. I want it just to start simmering. There, see there's a little bubble, that means it's hot enough. Now I'm going to put it into the lower third of a preheated 350 degree oven. And that, those are very thin fillets and I think I'm going to keep my eye on them in about four minutes. I think they ought to be done. Now I checked this a minute ago and it wasn't quite ready and now it's been a little over five minutes and I think it should be. That is done. And here's how you can tell the fish is opaque. It's not translucent. It also has a very slight spring to it. You don't want to overcook it. If you cook it until it flakes, it's overdone and you've lost all the juices. Now I'm covering it with my trusty pizza pan and I'm going to drain those juices into a little saucepan and we're going to make a beautiful sauce. Oh! <laughs> never, never very easy to do, but I think this is the only way to do it. I don't think sucking it out with a bulb baster is very successful. I'm just going to leave the fish covered with the pan, and I'm going to turn this into a white butter sauce. I'm going to boil down those juices until they're almost syrupy. Well, that's boiled way down, and now I'm just going to start beating in butter. The best way to add the butter is with your fingers as one piece is almost absorbed, add another one. And this will cream into a thick sauce. This is for people who have to gain weight, like me. Now that was a whole stick of butter that went in there. And now I'm going to put in, just for color, just a little bit of diced chopped tomato paste. I mean, diced chopped fresh tomatoes and a little bit of parsley. I think I can put in a little more tomato. And that sauce is now all ready to go over the fish. Now I ask you, isn't this a classy dish? 
fillets of fresh trout poached in white wine with a white butter sauce. Nothing wrong with this. If you're looking for scallops in your fish market, you'll probably find three different kinds. These are the little New England Bay scallops, sweet as a nut, always very expensive. And these are the great big sea scallops. You can cut them up and they'll look like bay scallops. And these littler ones are calico scallops. They're much cheaper and they're very nice too. And I'm going to do a recipe of scallops gratinade in the shell. And so I'm going to use some bay scallops. Why not? Might as well use the most expensive. I have there a pound or two cups. I'm going to put in a little bit of dry white wine or dry white vermouth, not enough to cover them, and about a tablespoon of shallots, and I'm just going to simmer them very gently on the stove. Now I added a bay leaf and a little bit of salt, and they should really barely simmer for not more than a minute or two. And you touch them with your finger when they have the slightest springiness, they're done. Now I'm going to pour out these delicious juices and we're going to make a sauce. And I have a roux here that's flour and butter cooked together, about three tablespoons of butter and three of flour. And then in goes my hot cooking juices. And stir them vigorously around. Let that come to the full boil and then simmer it for about two minutes to make sure that the flour is nicely cooked. Now there we are, that's really nice and thick. Put in about half a cup of really heavy cream and that's going to be ready to use now. Now here are my scallops, just barely cooked. There's the sauce. I'm going to put in just enough sauce to enrobe the scallops. I may not use it all, but I don't want too much. Let's stir that around. And then here on this tray I have some actual scallop shells. You can buy these in the hardware store and they're on some crumpled foil so that they won't tip over when I put in the scallops. And I'm just going to put in a nice big dollop of scallops in there. And I'm going to cover that with some grated cheese. And all of these shells are buttered. There, a little more cheese and now that goes onto the broiler. Now pop those right close under a red hot broiler and leave them for two or three minutes just until they've browned lightly and are bubbling hot. Scallops in wine sauce gratinade in their shells. Coquille Saint-Jacques. I've got a real collection of shrimp here from the little tiny Santa Barbara Ridgeback to a great big jumbo. I'm going to cook the so-called large shrimp and I want to peel it before cooking, and I always start at the underside. This is labor intensive, but my husband won't eat shrimp unless they're peeled. That makes more work for me, but it's worth it, I think. And I peel it down, just down to the last little bit. So I think it's nice to leave the tail on, because it's finger food. And then this little black thing up here is the intestine. And sometimes it's, you can't see it, and that means it's empty, but if it's black like that, I just take a paper towel and pull it out. It's really for cosmetic reasons. So that's now ready to cook. Now I have some very fine olive oil in this pan. I've just, just kind of filled it in go the shrimp. Now I'm going to flavor it up. There's a clove of garlic being squeezed in. And here's some scallions, or you could do shallots, about two tablespoons full. Got a few drops of sesame oil in there. And then toss that around. Need a little sprinkling of salt, a little bit of pepper. And as you're flavoring it, keep tossing them around so they'll cook easily. And a little bit of soy sauce. This is a kind of chinoiserie recipe. Now this is the tossing method. It's just easier than trying to turn them all the time. As you can see, they, they get red very quickly because of the soy 
Now well, they are a little dark, so that makes a lot of difference. I think they need a little more, find a little more olive oil there. And now I'm going to put in a little bit of French vermouth. Main thing is to give them some wonderful flavor. Then feel them, they should just be a little springy. Because these are such big shrimp, they take a little bit longer to cook than some. It's only about three or four minutes. I think those are done, I'm now gonna take them out into a bowl and reduce the cooking juices and that's gonna make a sauce. Now see how that sauce is boiled down and thickened? Now pour that over the shrimp. And then I know that's gonna need a little bit of lemon, so I'm gonna put a little bit of lemon juice in that. And these can be served hot, I mean warm or cold, but they should always be tossed around in their sauce for, and then let them stand and then toss them again several times every two or three minutes so that they'll absorb the sauce and then they'll be ready to serve. Shrimp sautéed in olive oil and garlic and other savory seasonings. Finger food at its finest. Look at these four beautiful live lobsters that came from the cold North Atlantic waters of Maine. I'm going to show you the best way to cook them. Now it's absolutely essential if you're going to cook lobsters that they be alive because a dead lobster goes off and deteriorates very, very quickly. And if you buy a already boiled lobster, you have no idea whether he was alive when you put him in the pot or not. So be sure that they're alive. And I think steaming is the very best way of cooking them for the home cook. And I just have an ordinary steaming contraption here, just a kettle, and there's a pie plate in there that's upside down. So stick the lobsters in head first, Clap on the cover. These are two pound lobsters, so they'll take 18 to 20 minutes. So I'm gonna set my timer for 18 minutes. There, time's up. This is how I tell whether they're done or not. I just pull off one of those little legs, break it apart, and I eat it. That's done. Now they're ready to eat hot with melted butter, but I'm going to do something else with them, so I'm going to let them cool off a little bit, then I'm going to take out the meat. Look at all that meat I've gotten out, but I haven't finished yet. When you get the chest off, don't forget this beautiful tamale. That's some of the best part of the lobster. And here's how to get the tail out. Take out the flippers and just push that tail meat out with your finger. Now we're ready to saute it. Now here in this pan, I have the sieve tamale, that green matter I told you to be sure and save. And that's just cooked for four or five minutes. Now here's the lobster meat. In that goes, and a little sprinkling of shallots or scallions, a little tiny bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. You want to stir that over heat for four or five minutes. I had four tablespoons of butter in there. I'm gonna add one more. You see that lobster meat is taking on a kind of salmon pink color, which is just lovely. And I'm putting in, oh, two or three tablespoons of Madeira wine. Let that cook down a moment. Now I'm gonna put in at least half a cup of heavy cream and just let that simmer a bit and that will steep. Now that's just thick and lightly and it's ready to serve. Sautéed lobster in Madeira cream. What a treat. Mm -hmm. Well, since this is all about eggs, let's begin by poaching an egg. Nothing difficult about that, is there? But of course, what I'm talking about is a beautiful poached egg where the yolk is surrounded by the white and it's a beautiful egg shape. So poaching just means dropping a naked egg into simmering water. There's your egg. You want to break it very carefully on the edge of the pan. 
and then open the shell wide and into the water it goes. Now I want the white to surround the yolk, so I'm just, just pushing that over and rolling the egg against the side of the pan. Oh, that doesn't look too good. Look at the yolk is kind of floating out free. These are supposed to be fresh eggs, but it doesn't look very good to me. Certainly don't win no beauty contests. There must be a better way. Now the reason that egg misbehaved is that it isn't hot out of the hen. It's not all that fresh and the white's a little bit watery. But you can remedy that by putting the whole egg in its shell in boiling water just to set that white a little bit. But first you have to prick the egg with a pin because there's an air bubble in the large end and that, that can expand in boiling water and crack the egg. So here there's a hole in the egg and now 10 seconds in boiling water. That's 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, 10 seconds, out she comes. Now here's another tip to help coagulate the white. Put in a quarter cup of vinegar. That's for one and a half quarts of water. Now take the water off. You don't want it bubbling. It should just be barely simmering. Crack the egg very carefully, open the shell wide, in it goes. There, look at that's much, much better. That's a good tip. Leave it for exactly four minutes. There's my four minutes. Out it comes and into a bowl of cold water that rinses off the vinegar and stops the cooking. Well, that's a method for poaching eggs that really works, but I've got an even easier system. Get yourself some of these oval metal perforated egg poachers. You can find them most anywhere. And here I've got my eggs with a hole punched and pre-boiled for 10 seconds. There's no vinegar in the water here. Just break that on the edge of the pan and drop it in. See how that holds the egg? Set your timer for four minutes and when they're done, put them in cold water just as we did for the other eggs. You can store your poached eggs after you've cooked them. Just put your bowl of water in the refrigerator, but don't cover it, and they'll keep perfectly for two or three days. When you want to reheat chilled poached eggs, have a pan of almost simmering water, put a little salt in, and drop in the eggs. Let them heat for exactly one minute. Now, however you serve your poached eggs, be sure that they are dry. Roll them in a slotted spoon over a towel. Serve them cold in a salad, napped with a green mayonnaise. Or hot, the classic eggs benedict, napped with holiday sauce. Num, num. Every good cook has got to be able to make an omelet. And the first consideration is having the right pan. Now this is a perfect pan, I think. It's a professional shape. The sides are slanting outward and they're two inches deep. The top is about 10 inches across. The bottom is about seven and a half to seven inches across. It has a long handle. And the important thing is the omelet will not stick to the pan. This is a no stick pan. And I'm gonna set this over heat and put in a tablespoon of butter. And while that's melting, we'll go at the eggs. And this pan will make a two to three egg omelet. These are two large eggs. Then I'm putting in a little bit of salt and about a half teaspoon of water and a little bit of pepper. And the salt and the water help the eggs to blend when you beat them. You just want to beat them up just enough so that the whites and yolks are blended. You don't want it to be foamy. And then look at your butter in there. That's foaming up. You tilt the pan in all directions. And the butter has to be very, very hot. The eggs have to sizzle as they go in. And just about as the butter foam has subsided, in go the eggs. Then you let that settle just a little bit on the bottom to form a skin. And you'll see why, because now I'm gonna start jerking the pan. See, by pulling it towards me, the omelet is beginning to fold up on itself. Take your fork and push together anything there. And that has now formed itself 
in the bottom of the bottom lip of the panda. Watch my hand movement here. Palm below, thumb on top. I'm about to unmold it onto a warm plate. Tilt plate and pan together. Turn pan over, and there's your omelet, all formed and ready to serve. Now a cheese omelet. That's almost exactly the same as a plain omelet. I've got my hot butter in there. There are my two eggs. Let that sit for a moment for the skin to form. Then swish it around just a little bit. And in goes two tablespoons of grated Swiss cheese. I always like to put in a little bit of parsley. And now begin jerking the pan towards you. All right. And there's a cheese omelet ready to serve. Now here's another very nice filling for an omelet. Sauteed diced potatoes with shallots and parsley. And this is almost the same. You have to do it a bit by the seat of your pants always. There's the hot butter. There are the two eggs. They're going to sit in there to get their skin forming a little bit and then shaking it around again. And then in go the potatoes. No. There we are. That's pretty fast, isn't it? No. Over we go. And there you are, ready to serve a potato omelet. Now, if your omelet isn't perfect as it comes out of the pan, which is often the case, it's quite legitimate to shore it up with your impeccably clean hand. Put on a little bit of parsley. And of course, there are loads of other fillings. Omelets are so quick and easy. If you want to be an omelet whiz, make lots and lots of them. Practice makes perfect. You know, the wonderful thing about the egg is that when it's heated, it coagulates and holds other foods in suspension. In other words, it turns into a custard. And I'm going to do today a little savory first course custard known as, known as a tambal. You can make it out of ham or chicken livers. I'm going to use grated fresh corn. You can use, of course, canned cream corn, but if you've got a grater and fresh corn, this is so good. You just grate it all out, and you'll need about 12 ears to make three cups, which I need here. And then I, I need six eggs. I have five in there, and there's my sixth one. Just beat that up, and then in goes your corn. And then we have a grated small onion, that's two or three tablespoons of grated onion, and about a teaspoon of salt, and about three or four teaspoons, tablespoons of fresh parsley. There's two-thirds cup of fresh white breadcrumbs, two-thirds cup of grated Swiss cheese, exactly two-thirds cup of very fine heavy cream, and six or eight squirts of Tabasco sauce, and eight grinds of pepper. That was exactly eight, I believe. Now stir that all up, and it's ready to cook. Now this recipe actually makes two quarts of the tambal mixture. I don't need that much, because I only want eight of these little Pyrex cups, which hold two-thirds cup about. So I'm going to save the rest, because it'll keep nicely in the refrigerator. Now this is going to cook in a bain marie, that means in a pan of boiling water. I think the easiest way to do this is to put this pan in the oven and pull the rack out, and then pour the boiling water around it. Otherwise, I think walking with a pan of boiling water, you might have a bit of trouble. And we need enough water to come about halfway up these little cups. And the reason for the bain marie is because you want a custard to cook very slowly. If the water actually boils, the custard is going to be grainy. So I've got the oven set at 350, and I'm going to come back in five minutes and look at it. Now that's been a good five minutes. I'm going to check that water. I see that's hot. I don't want the water to boil. I'm going to turn the thermostat down to 325. It's going to take about half an hour in all. So check it every once in a while. Well, that's been a little over half an hour, and here's how you test for doneness. You see, they've puffed up a little bit. You take a skewer and put that right through in the center. 
that comes out clean, they're done. And also, they still tremble just a little bit. You don't want to overcook them. So I'm going to take them out and let them cool, and they'll be ready to serve. Now, after these have settled, you just take a little bit of a knife, and you go all the way around the edge of it to loosen it. And these, of course, they're still warm. And then take your plate, turn it upside down, and out it comes. And then put a little bit of sauce on. That's a nice cream sauce with herbs. But you don't have to confine yourself to this small shape. You can big, do a big mold. There's a spinach tambal with a mushroom sauce. This is ham with a tomato sauce. These make beautiful first course or luncheon dishes, all thanks to the egg. Another fine example of the custard is the quiche. But rather than being baked in a dish, it's baked in a pie shell. Like this, this is a pre-baked pie shell. You always want that. Homemade, or you can get a store-bought shell and pre-bake that. And the filling can be almost anything, but it always is pre-cooked and nicely seasoned. In this case, here's broccoli that's been blanched and then seasoned with butter, salt, and pepper. Or here's an example with shrimp, sautéed in butter with a little wine flavoring. Or crisply cooked bacon and cheese. But whatever you do, the custard formula is exactly the same. For every one half cup of custard, you have one egg, and the remainder is milk or cream up to the one half cup mark. See if that's really, well, there's the one half cup mark. And then multiply them and mix as necessary. Now here's a mixture here, and you want to season that very nicely with a little salt and a little pepper and a few little scrapes of nutmeg. Beat that up nicely. And then that pour that into your shell. And you want to pour in just enough so it comes in to about the one, about one eighth inch of the top. Don't overfill because it swells slightly. And it might burst out of the shell. And then just cover that with a little bit of grated cheese. And that's ready for the oven. I want to serve this for lunch at 1, so I'm putting it in now. It'll take 30 to 35 minutes to cook, and I want it to cool off and settle a little bit. I'm putting it into a preheated 375 degree oven in the upper third. Mmm, look at that broccoli quiche with that lovely cheesy brown topping. That's a beauty. And here's the shrimp that's flavored with cheese and tarragon. And then this simple, just bacon and cheese, that's a lovely combination. And those are only three of an infinite number of possibilities when you're thinking about quiche. One of the hallmarks of a good cook, or of a good restaurant for that matter, is how well they make that classic dessert, creme caramel, or caramel custard. If you've never made one before, it's really kind of miraculous how it works. You start out with the caramel. And for every one cup of sugar, you add one third cup of water. And then you want to dissolve that over high heat. And you have to have the sugar completely dissolved so that you let it come up to the simmer. You see that's come up to the simmer. Take that off heat and look very, very carefully at it. The liquid should be absolutely clear, showing that the sugar is completely dissolved. If it's not dissolved, the syrup will crystallize. Here's another trick. Let it boil hard and cover it very closely. The reason for that is that the steam condenses on the cover, washes down the sides of the pan, and that also prevents crystallization. Now let it boil hard until the syrup begins to thicken. Now that's been two or three minutes you see that's really, the bubbles are starting to thicken. You're getting near the caramel stage. Never stir it after it starts boiling. And we'll just keep watching it now until it begins to brown. Now keep looking at it. See, those are very, very thick bubbles. And it's going to start turning brown any minute. Just keep swirling the pan gently by its handle until it begins to brown. Now, look at that. That is a real caramel color, ready to caramelize the mold. And this is a flame-proof 
glass mold, and I'm going to put just half of that caramel in there. I'm going to save the, other, save the other half to make a little extra sauce. There never is enough. And now, you want to swirl the caramel around in the mold, and you've got to do that for two or three minutes until it has hardened. See that? Take a little while until it stops running. Now that's almost ready, but I can see it's still moving. I want it to coat the mold firmly. Now you see how that's hardened on the sides and the bottom of the mold. Now I can fill it. There. Now the custard mixture for a two-quart mold is six whole eggs, five egg yolks, and then you gradually stir in, mix that up first, and then gradually stir in three-fourths cup of sugar. The thing is, I don't want to make too many bubbles here. And then we introduce one quart of hot milk. You add that gradually because you don't want to scramble your eggs. Then after about half of it's gone in, you can pour it in a little faster. But as you notice, I'm really just mixing, I'm not beating. And you mix it around and take a little taste of it until the sugar is completely dissolved. Now when the sugar is completely dissolved, you now want the flavoring. I'm going to put in a little pinch of salt there, not too much and a tablespoon of pure vanilla extract. Stir that up, and that's now ready to be strained into the mold. I'm going to put the mold in a pan because I'm going to cook this in a bain-marie, a pan of water, and you'll see why I strain it in in just a moment. That just pours right in. That's really a very easy mixture, isn't it? You see there's a bit of coagulated egg there. That's why you strain it. This is now ready for the oven. I have my oven preheated here to 350. The rack is about in the middle, and in goes boiling water to come up about a third the way up the mold. It's terribly important here that you regulate the oven heat so that the water never actually boils. If it does, it's going to turn the custard grainy, so keep your eye on it. It will take about an hour in all. Now well, that's been a good hour. Let's take a look at it. You want to have, here's how to tell how it's done. Take a skewer, plunge it down through the center, and if the skewer comes out clean, it's done. It should also tremble very slightly because you don't want to overcook it. And now take it out of the oven and let that cool for at least an hour. Now that's cooled off, ready to unmold, and I've just loosened it all around the sides with a little knife. You can also tell it's ready because you can pull it from the sides of the mold. Where is the caramel, you may well ask. There, part of it's down in the bottom, and the rest of, them has, rest of it is cooked in with the custard, which makes it so delicious to eat. Now here is a serving platter, so I'm bringing it over to the edge so I can get a grip on it, and then very carefully turn it upside down gently so it won't bust. And um, <coughs> that making funny little noises there. Clump, 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 clump. Oh, there it is. Whether you call this creme caramel or caramel custard, it's one of the loveliest desserts ever invented. <laughs>
but I have a combination of peanut oil and olive oil. There. Let's take a look at that. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? Let's have a little taste. Mmm, that's delicious. All ready to use. Homemade mayonnaise on poached chicken breasts, on hard boiled eggs, on tuna fish, on just about anything. But remember, it's addictive. Holiday sauce, that lovely, buttery, warm, lemony creation. It just scares some people to death because it can curdle or separate. But if you know what you're doing, you won't have any trouble. So here's how. I've got in this pan three egg yolks. And before you start anything you want to whip them up until they're pale and lemon colored. And don't, don't not do this because it's really the key to success. See there, that's fairly thick. It's almost a sauce. And that took me a good minute. Now we're ready to be and put in a pinch of salt and about a tablespoon of fresh lemon juice and a tablespoon of butter, which is just going to sit there. And I'm going to put the sauce over direct heat. And I want to stir that until it begins to thicken into a cream. And one thing is you, what we're trying to do is very slowly thicken these egg yolks. And if you have it over direct heat, you can always take it off heat if you think it's getting too hot. And the reason for the butter here, it protects the egg yolk so they don't get the shock of heat. And if they get a shock, they may turn grainy. Now just to see how it's heating, put your impeccably clean finger in there and see if that's warming up. That is, it's beginning to thicken. That is thick enough. See, that's holding in the wires of the whip. You want to stop the cooking, so put in a piece of cold butter, and that'll cool it off so it won't thicken anymore. And then it's time to add the melted butter. I'm just going to put that on a towel there. And I have melted butter in here. I've got about two sticks. And just very, very slowly dribble that in, just as though you were making a mayonnaise. Just dribble, dribble, until it really starts to thicken. So I'm adding just the last of the butter, and you see that little milky residue at the bottom of the pan. I'm not going to add that. And then taste that very carefully for seasoning. Oh, that looks just right. I'll just have to see how it is, really. Mm -hmm. Very good. Ready to serve. Now here's some poked salmon. Imagine that without this buttery, lemony, beautiful hollandaise sauce. Unthinkable. What is a souffle after all? It's just a very thick sauce base with a flavoring into which you fold beaten egg whites. When you put it in the oven to bake it, the egg whites expand and the souffle puffs up. And you can either have a sweet souffle for dessert or you can have a main course souffle. And I'm going to make a cheese souffle. And here I have three tablespoons of butter and three tablespoons of flour, and I'm cooking it together until it foams like this for about two minutes. That cooks the flour, and then it off heat. And this cooked flour and butter is called a roux, R-O-U-X. And now I have one cup of hot milk, and I'm going to pour that in all at once. The bubbling has stopped in the hot milk, goes all at once, and then immediately Stir it vigorously with a wire whip. And then bring that up to the boil. And while that's coming up to the boil, put in a little flavoring. There's a bit of paprika. And here's a little nutmeg grater, grater so that you always have fresh nutmeg. Just two or three little scratches of it. Pepper, two or three squirts of pepper. And then about half a teaspoon of salt. And then stir that up, and you want to boil that for two minutes. Now, this is called a bechamel. It's one of the mother sauces. And it's because the velouté is made with fish or chicken stock, and this is always made with milk, the bechamel. 
And after that's boiled for two minutes, take it off heat, and now you're ready to add the eggs. Now I'm going to beat my egg whites in this bowl. It's very, very clean, but as an added precaution, I have some vinegar and salt in here. And that makes it even cleaner, and it also manages to give the egg whites an extra push. That's a good thing to do. And now I could crack the eggs and dump the whites right in there, but that's dangerous. Because if I get any yolk at all into the whites, they won't mount up as they should. I'm very carefully breaking the white into a little separate bowl just to be safe. Now the yolk gets beaten into that hot sauce and the white goes into this very clean bowl and I'm going to have four eggs in all. Now here is a fifth egg. I don't need the yolk. I'm going to save that for mayonnaise. And I'm going to add this fifth white in here so I have five whites in all for extra puffing power. Now let's get to the souffle mold. Now the souffle dish itself, this is one that's three inches deep and seven and a half inches across. It's been buttered and sprinkled with Parmesan cheese. And I have on here a removable collar of buttered wax paper so that when the souffle rises, I can quickly remove the paper and we'll have a tremendous drama. One more important thing, preheat your oven to 400 degrees, which this is because once you start beating your egg whites, there's no more stopping. So I have my five egg whites at room temperature in here. And I'm going to first step is to beat them until they foam throughout. Look, they're now foaming. At this point, I put in a pinch of salt and also about a quarter teaspoon of cream of tartar. That helps the eggs to stabilize. Now beat them until they're stiff and shiny. Look, I think these are ready. See, they're forming up. If those are perfect, you want to stand right over them all the time because you can easily overbeat them. Now, ready to add to the sauce. Now stir a great big dollop of them into the sauce to lighten it. And then, Pour the sauce down the side of the egg whites. There's the last of it. Now I'm going to fold it in. Here's the movement. Plunge your spatula down into the center. Turn it around. Bring it up. And you're bringing a bit of the egg white over the sauce. And at the same time, begin sprinkling in the cheese. I've got a cup for about three and a half ounces of grated Swiss cheese. There's the last of the cheese. The reason you add it with the egg whites is it makes a lighter souffle. Now into the mold. There. Now just give it a little swirl around the top, and it's ready for the oven. Now, in it goes to the oven in the lower third. And I'm going to turn the thermostat down to 375 and do not open the oven door for 25 minutes. Now, that should be done. That's been about 30 minutes. And that seems to be holding. So out on a plate, and then I have to take off the collar. There's that pin. We'll just pull it off, I think. Uh oh, yes, that's holding up. Isn't that something? That's lovely. Well, here we go. Well, there you are a handsome, elegant, fragrant cheese souffle. And thank goodness, it's standing tall. That is just a butter and flour. Well, I hope you've enjoyed all this on fish and on eggs, and I hope you'll enjoy the rest of our six-part series we call The Way to Cook. This is Julia Child. Bon appétit.